the, the talk today is Practical Systems Thinking for Networks and Organizational Change. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to confine this mostly to the domain of organizational uh, network analysis for organizational change or organizational network analysis because that's my comfort zone and where I'm familiar. I've been doing it maybe uh, four years now for various clients, uh, large and small. Um, and uh, the purpose of the talk really is to basically describe a little bit from, from a beginner's level um, what this is, how you do it, what it's useful for, um, and then to prime us for a conversation where we can uh, discuss the application of these methods to um, our systems thinking and um, uh, systems change uh, challenges that we have. Um, so to give a contrast, um, organizational network analysis happens within the confines of uh, one organization. Um, contrasted to ecosystem network analysis, which is more about mapping nodes and relationships in uh, systems of systems, if you want. Um, yeah, let's move along. A little bit of context uh, to start us with. Um, many people who are interested now in systems change and systems thinking um, are aware of this shift from this kind of industrial era way of doing things towards what we've been calling the connected age. Some call it the fourth industrial revolution or what have you, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and uh, most of our organizations are optimized to work according to the methodologies and ideas that we had available during the industrial age. And we're all scratching our heads and figuring out what is the contemporary version of that, that is systems and complexity aware. Um, so this is the context in which we might be interested in this uh, network analysis. And we have this idea that uh, nobody's got a recipe book for the connected age, but there's some promising patterns that we know have been yielding results. And that's attention to these different category of things, complex systems. And within complexity theory, there's um, like some, some dimensions of that are things like uh, nonlinear systems, self-organization, adaptive systems, and network theory. So this locates a little bit why we might be wanted, why we might be interested in this kind of practice and these analytical methods, um, because it is a key component of complexity theory, and we're trying to get a handle on the complex world now. Um, and in systems thinking, so in the old industrial era, on the first part, uh, we were concerned with analysis, parts reductionisms, and some of the parts, whereas in systems thinking, we want to be thinking more along the lines of synthesis, relations, whole systems, and uh, holistics. And this relations thing is a key component. Um, if we want to think about the ecosystems and social systems, this is the mindset and uh, thinking approach we need to be taking. Again, we're leaving behind our comfort zone of industrial era mental models. Um, and so like one way to classify, um, to introduce the idea of the importance of the relationships in uh, networks is that in the past we thought, uh, imagine you're a public services ma manager and uh, you have some new objective given to you. Uh, the typical thinking would be, what parts have I got and which way can I uh, arrange them in order to meet my goal? So think of a bunch of things and the method in which you organize them. Um, and then in a new way, we're asking, how can I leverage the understanding of the relationships between the parts to meet my goals? Um, and so that means that we're not necessarily moving things around, but we're engineering at the relationship between those things in order to um, uh, develop uh, whatever outcome we want given our, our new goals. This might still sound a little bit abstract. Hopefully it becomes a little bit clearer when we start looking in. Um, and one thing to point out is that uh, here on the left, we have this kind of, um, uh, this is a network diagram of an organizational chart, right? An organization chart is a network diagram. It's just a pretty simplistic one with not very much information. Um, but actually this one on the right-hand side here, is a more accurate re representation of the way that real relationships work within uh, a function of an organization. 
So we sometimes talk about in the past, we've been working with really low resolution, low information maps and making uh, in organizational context and making quite expensive and uh, profound decisions using those, uh, that particular tool. Now we have uh, the possibility to have much higher resolution, more higher information map and a, and a better kind of accurate high resolution picture of what's going on within the system that we're trying to effect some change in. Uh, or in a more simplistic way, we have this kind of linear orientated hierarchical diagram, but this little cartoon here says that the relationships between the nodes are a lot more complex um, than that. So we're trying to understand what's going on here. Um, and uh, this is from our friend Dave Gray in America, who recommend his uh, 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 book, The Connected Company, but essentially he's trying to articulate that it's a mythology that we have these neat hierarchical systems, the behaviors and different patterns of interaction between um, uh, people are a lot more complex. So how could we see that? Let's see if we... Okay. Um, so this is uh, the nervous system of a real organization. This is what uh, organizational network analysis uh, program yields. And um, far from, I mean, at first look, it looks like a really sexy visualization and a lot of people get seduced um, uh, by that. Um, but more importantly, uh, this is a multimodal reflection of what is going on within an organization at a number of different levels. So how people are talking to each other, how decisions are getting made, how money is moving through the organization, how technical support works. Um, and right now, this is what we call a hairball, right? From this, you can't extract any actionable insight. This is just all of your raw materials that you can then subject to analysis in order to find interesting patterns. Um, but these network maps, you should think of them as um, they're, they're tools that can be used in a number of different ways. So they're sense-making tools. Um, it allows you to see things from which you can infer uh, or you can determine different patterns. There are also storytelling tools. Once you understand what these lines mean and what the data that they represent, then you can start telling stories about what's going on in your organization and then measure them against, um, is that what you expected to see or are you seeing something that was completely unexpected? Later on, I'll show you a couple of examples when we go into the network metrics of stories that came out of uh, an analysis and the kind of impact that that had on the organization. Um, yeah, they're pattern finding tools and they're also decision making aids. Uh, with one really big healthy caveat, I would say, uh, never make a decision entirely based on um, some insight that a network data set is suggesting to you. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a guide and a starting point. You, have to, you can't leave all your other decision making tools aside. This is just supposed to reinforce you with better data and insight alongside your, your kind of existing practice. Um, and there are three, three broad types of stories that you can tell from a network. So the first is the topography or the story of the structure. And here we ask things like this is a quite dense, um, uh, highly concentrated structure with a couple of different uh, and we can see the structure is telling us interesting things like I might want to find out what's going on here. There's a bit of a linear pattern um, uh, that's emerging, which is quite distinct from the different um, other kind of patterns that we see. So we look at the shape of things and is it connected? Is it highly fragmented? Is it dense? Is it very sparse? All of those things give us indications as to the nature of the characteristics of the network we're looking at. Um, the next type of story we can tell is the individual, the story of a node and how it experiences the network. So if I was this little, these are all people within an organization, these nodes. Um, if I was this person, then my experience of this system is a lot different to if I was this person remote. It's essentially, if I'm this person over here, something should happen to this person, I would be entirely disconnected from the rest of the thing. So we can look at the individual nodes and start kind of telling stories about what is their experience, what is, how does that relate to their role and function within a system. Um, 
And then finally, the last one is the journey of um, the story of traveling connections between nodes. This, for example, is particularly interesting um, when you're looking at decision making chains and things like that, um, or who needs to authorize particular things before they can happen. And let us suppose, I'm not telling you that it is for sure, but let us suppose that this cluster here is actually the senior leadership or the decision-making body of this particular system. What do you think the journey from this node down here is into that decision-making process? Um, we can't tell from this hairball, we could filter out some things. It might only be two connections, for example. So while they look spatially far away, they're actually quite, have, have quite good access to the uh, central system. Uh, or it might be that they have to go through 10 different, the, the shortest distance path between this person and the decision making head might be 10, 15, 20 people. And then really they have no leverage or purchase on that. And we don't know yet, but this person might be key to, for example, um, uh, solving a, a a pandemic episode or something like that. Um, so a little bit of caution. Uh, uh, network maps are dangerously seductive eye candy. A lot of people get really excited when they see this thing and they say, yes, I want to go in without really thinking it through. Uh, they're highly prone to bias interpretation. Um, and they're pretty useless if you don't know what you're trying to fix. So before, um, right. I've just had a ping to check the moment for chats. Uh, I'll take a little sidebar before we go to the next slide. Um, okay, which, with which tools and what was the use case story behind the picture you have built um, here? Um, so this particular use case was um, a public sector organization that resulted in the merger of three previous public sector organizations which is quite unusual for a public uh, sector in, in uh, context. Um, the tool that was used to make uh, this particular visualization is called Polynode. It's an Australian software as a service um, system. And uh, we use it with, in those kind of circumstances because the, it incorporates well the data collection, the survey-based data collection and the analytical and visualization tools. Uh, somebody said it looks like Gephi. I, I can easily, once you have the data, you can easily move it from one uh, to another. So for some, some analytical use cases, I might take the data from Polynode and put it into Gephi because there's some kind of layouts and uh, uh, analytical algorithms I can use um, uh, that aren't available in the Polynode. I, Think and somebody asked multimodal how I've got I'll I'll address that in a um, uh, couple some slides. Um, is contextual information included in the network map? I, uh, I'll watch out for the answer to this one coming up when I talk about like the process that we go through from data collection into uh, generating insights, which is essentially um, we do put. Uh, we can flip on name labels um, at one point, but in a hairball situation, it's completely useless. It's once you've done some analytics and got some insights. Um, okay, thanks, Mikhail's doing notes to Poland. If I've missed any, um, uh, then I'll try to get back to them. Um, my toolbar's in a way. So what kind of system issues can be addressed with organizational network analysis? So the kinds of contexts in which this might be interesting is, for example, if you're restructuring an organization, um, if you're trying to answer the, like, we know that the, uh, devolving decision-making power to the point where it's closest to the information, that's, that's a kind of application where uh, this is quite useful in making decisions. Um, uh, internal communications, um, it helps to see the network that you're dealing with if you want to do something about it. Um, understanding how power really works. Um, it's usually senior people in organizations that commission this kind of work and they're usually quite surprised to see how completely disconnected <laughs> they are from how decisions are actually getting made within organizations. So that's usually an eye opener. Um, uh, business continuity, identifying key people. Um, I'll give an example of that in a, a 
uh, minute and then designing for emergent behavior. And here I mean like um, one of the challenges a lot of organizations face is how to facilitate cross silo working when everything has been designed and engineered to segregate uh, kind of parts of an organization. But with this network analysis, we can all, we can surface latent networks between those silos already, which are understood or recognized in the formal structuring. Um, and when you can see that, then you can start kind of investing or shifting roles a little bit in order to make use of the latent networks that already exist. Um, so let's dive into Networks 101 a little bit. Some very basic definitions so we're all on the same page. A network is a collection of nodes and links. That's it. Two dots, one line between them, that's a network. Uh, so an organization chart is a network where the nodes are people and the links just tell you who manages who, right? So it's a valid network, but it's very low information. Nodes are things with properties that can be quantified. Um, so we had a, a small discussion a couple days ago about at actor network theory. So in actor network theory, essentially the nodes can be people or technologies or you know living beings and inanimate. It's a composite network in, in involving all of those. Um, generally, in organizational context, we're talking about people. Um, so people are things, and they can be quantified, and they can also be qualified. So uh, data in your model for each node can have quantitative and qualitative data. And by that, I mean, um, Alice has been with the company for 10 years, right? Bob has been with the company for five years. They both have a time served attribute with different uh, uh, numbers in that. Um, we could think of some kind of qualitative um, uh, uh, attributes that we want, we want to include with them. Uh, links are connections between nodes and have properties also that can be quantified. So um, uh, I have been drinking with a beer with Mikhail. So me and Mikhail are the nodes. Drinking beer is the relationship. And that can have, that can be quantified. So like, is it three years, um, for example? Um, and this is kind of important. Um, uh, this is kind of important when we're looking at, for example, communications relationship, because Mikhail and I communicate with each other. That's interesting to know, but most people in a small organization communicate with each other. Now we'd like to know how frequently we communicate with each other. So is it once a year or once a month or once a week or daily or hourly kind of thing? That information can be encoded in the relationship data within a network. And it's terribly important to understand what's really going on. Um, and uh, this is from our friend Valdis Krebs, who's um, uh, uh, much uh, longer in this game than we are. He, he's known for mapping the 9-11 terrorist network um, from open source things. But this is his mantra, know the network so that you can knit the network. You want to understand what's going in the system so that then you can make interventions that shift it in a direction that you want. And now we're going to look a little bit about know the network. Uh, Katarina, I've seen your question um, trying to make predictions based on network theory. Um, if it's okay, I'm going to leave that one to the discussion. I think it's a little bit difficult to just, yeah, okay, cool. Um, so the process, broadly, three steps. Figure out what you're trying to solve, uh, what goals you have, which way you want to shift your system. On the basis of that, that will inform what your data model should be, what kind of attribute data you want in the nodes and relationships. Then you gather, clean, structure the data for network analysis. The basic structure is two tables, one with the nodes and one with the relationships. You can get more complex into graph databases if you want, but the basic is that two spreadsheets, one with your nodes and attributes and one with the relationships. And then you run analysis and create visualizations that you can observe for patterns and insights. In terms of data gathering, um, there's a number of different ways you can do it. The, the most um, uh, commonly used and also the most open to kind of discussions about the purity of the data is survey-based uh, data. So you, you, you design a survey based on the data model, which is related to the problem you're trying to solve. Then you cascade it through the organization and people self-report back things. Um, uh, I won't go into a big debate on like, you know, what's, whether that's the most uh, effective 
um, uh, thing, but that's generally the most accessible. Um, and then there's things like snowball sampling. So I might not know who the system is, but I know that Mikhail is part of it. So I will name Mikhail in my survey as a key node that this network should factor in. And then the survey will ask Mikhail, who are the people that you think should be in there? And as additional people get named, the survey goes on to those. So you can kind of grow bigger networks. Um, other stuff is available like metadata mining, you know, harvesting email logs, uh, organizational data from line of business systems, um, uh, social interaction data, and other kinds of harvesting activities from the existing uh, data. But you, at the simplest level, you can get somewhere with a survey. These are a lot more kind of sophisticated and ethically uh, difficult. Um, so quick, what kind of nodes can you have? Generally people, if you're doing a wider system, a node could be an organization, it can also be documents. Um, uh, if we go into active network theory, then we'd be talking about technological assets um, and stuff. And also relationships, um, uh, links can be uh, uh, different. So it can be like social relationships or uh, a physical proximity, contracts, decision flows, uh, things like that. They can be tangible or intangible, right? So if I'm using cities as nodes and roads as links, I'm mapping a tangible network. Um, if I'm mapping people and how they communicate with each other, it's, uh, well, is that intangible? If I'm mapping social support structures within an organization, that's quite intangible. Um, by the way, never ask people ever, who do you trust? It just gets you garbage data and a lot of trouble and bad feeling and just don't do it ever. Um, so here's an example of Alice who has some attributes like we might, if it was important, collect gender, age, current location, T, KPI performance score, time served, things like that. And there are different relationships that we could manage, uh, that, that we could map to her. So who she works for, who she communicates with, who she approves the decisions of, um, what metric she's accountable for, or who did she give COVID to, for example. That's a pretty topical network mapping question these days. Uh, there was a question about uh, multimodal networks. So essentially, multimodal network is you don't just map one um, network. So communications, who talks to who, is one network. Uh, how do decisions get made in an organization is a different one, and they don't necessarily correlate to each other. Um, you would hope, it's interesting, when you've got both of the networks, you would hope that the people who make decisions together also talk together, but that's not necessarily always the case. Um, financial uh, 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 networks also quite interesting, you know, how the money is allocated in relation to the decision making of the organization. So this is a basic explanation of, let us imagine that this is the financial allocation um, uh, net, uh, network. It looks in one way. It's got particular hub and spoke topology. I guess that's the chief accountant. Um, then we might have how people um, communicate with each other, and it's a slightly different topology. And then we might have um, who goes to who for decision making, which is a slightly different kind of topology. And this is our multimodal network, which kind of layers all of them together. And we might want to filter out irrelevant networks for particular analysis or have them in certain combinations or just isolate them independently. Um, so here's an example again. It's actually the same system um, that we saw before, slightly different layout. And um, uh, the coloring is uh, done using a community detection algorithm. But on the left-hand side, this is the communication pattern of this organization. Um, and then uh, because we've got that network loaded, the community detection is run on that. So we can see these are all like uh, particular conversations that are happening. Uh, we don't yet say whether they relate to uh, structural realities or not, but this is how technical support happens within the same organization. And then the community detection algorithm is, is run on that again. So we can see that the nature of the relationships and technical support um, are quite different and have a like completely different density than the communication networks and stuff. No question. Uh, uh, okay, can the nodes be 
uh, roles or certain type of action, for example, goalkeeping. In, in, um, yes, you you can uh, you can have uh, uh, node attributes as roles, and actually one of the um, interventions that you can make when we get to the knitting the network stuff is a decision to repurpose the role of a particular node given its position in the network. Um, so, for example, some people can can have uh, hide between the centrality, which means that they're they're a bridgey person. They're they're somehow connecting various clusters. Well, if your um, uh, business objective is to increase the communication between two uh, non-communicating clusters, um, then I would want to know the name of that node with the high between the centrality, and it might be that, for example, um, uh, they don't have a communication role yet but they need to have one because they're optimized to solve that particular problem. Um, maybe later in the discussion, if somebody reminds me, there's a really cute story about a factory in Austria that was really screwing up, but then uh, an analysis of this type identified a very interesting and totally unexpected node. So I'll plant that, maybe we talk in the discussion. Um, we have some, uh, me organize, can use, oh, apparently me analytics, is something in O365. I haven't used that myself. I would presume um, that if it's uh, if it's harvesting graph data, then it should be able to export it, even if it's those two sheets I talk about, or in a graph ML format or GFX uh, things. I would hope so. Let's remember the Austrian. Um, yeah, once you've collected your data, you basically you start with a hairball that tells you nothing, but given the question that you're asking of it. Uh, you apply filters. So, for example, um, I might be only interested in people who are in the logistics function. So I filter everybody else out, and then I'm left with kind of a subset, which is the logistics um, function. Um, and then I might want to know who are the most highly connected people within the logistics function. So I would run my between the centrality um, uh, metrics. And then later, I might want to know who is the person with the highest between the centrality, and maybe I filtered them across three different locations. And I've decided for this business objective, we need to get Davy and Flynn into um, uh, the room because the network data is suggesting that they are the, the most highly. And earlier, there was a question about the, the kind of like annotations and stuff. We always, as good practice, leave the names out until the end. And earlier I talked to about this process being highly susceptible to um, uh, biases and stuff. If we start with having name labels here, um, somebody who's not kind of uh, competent or skilled is gonna get drawn uh, in network analysis or familiar with it, is likely to get drawn into a particular grouping of names and say, let's look over there and see what we find. And that, that kind of garbage is your whole. Uh, we wanna just do the math on the numbers, um, on the data, and then we want to see what is it telling us socially. The moment you stick the name labels on, um, uh, really interesting social dynamics start happening in the room that you're presenting to, and you have to uh, uh, temper it. Uh, sometimes when these names appear, it's like, that's completely obvious, and sometimes it's extremely surprising. And at this moment, you need to restrain your desire to kind of jump to conclusions and say, oh, now we know what to do. Like, well, now we have a guide that is telling us to have a conversation to explore further, really. Um, so like I said, when we've collected the data, we can do the math on it. There's a, there's a whole range of um, network analysis metrics from graph theory, this kind of field of mathematics. Um, I'm going to list just a couple of quite common ones here. I'm not gonna, today going to do the full list of all of the super advanced ones, but some of the basic ones. Degree is essentially just counting how many connections happen to a node. And that can be like coming in or going out or in, in, in total. And these can be used, used for example, finding unusual concentrations of power or identifying isolated assets. Um, I've mentioned between the centrality. Um, this is the bridginess or um, uh, how between different clusters people are located. Um, so good business use cases, finding people who can bridge fragmented team. 
also useful if you're designing for emergence between non-collaborative silos. Um, closeness is kind of a measure of how in the middle of an action a node is. Um, identifying bottlenecks uh, in decision-making networks or in pandemic circumstances, if you had network data on all of your friends, uh, you would run to, want to run the closeness centrality and stay away from those people first. Um, uh, also between, high, between the centrality um, uh, measures in that case. Um, eigenvector and cats are measures of influence. So the other day there was posted a, a video about diffusion and propagation in networks. Uh, how might we want to use the understanding of the data that we've got um, uh, to uh, uh, transmit messages or ideas effectively through a system? These are the kind of metrics you would want to be looking for to do that. And I, I do have a few examples of these, like more than just a table. <coughs> and um, Louvain communities, this is the, the community detection algorithm, and it's quite useful, we found in restructuring uh, circumstances. So when you have the data and you start kind of running your analytical patterns, this is the typical quadrant of things that you can find. And here is where the magic uh, happens. Um, this is where you can immediately extract the most value from these kind of things. I mean, of course, it's nice to be reassured that uh, what you expected to see and you wanted to see is in fact there, um, but it's the things that you didn't know that you were looking for um, that can spring up at you it, like in topolo uh, topographical, uh, topological uh, patterns and stuff. Um, that's where the, the juice is. So some cases um, where the negative unexpected in organizational network analysis has come is that like our latest efficiency drive just lost us our most valuable institutional knowledge asset. Well, if you're going to do an efficiency drive next time, would you like to know who your most valuable institutional knowledge asset to make sure that it's not like some accountant putting red lines through spreadsheets that's getting rid of really critical um, uh, knowledge or two teams involved in delivering a mission critical process don't actually talk to each other. Um, there's an interesting example from Taiwan about how all the different government um, uh, bodies have been coordinating really, really well. Um, uh, and uh, in the corona outbreak and contrast that with the US where kind of like the federal government and the local government are bidding against each other <laughs> for care medical uh, supplies. Um, or yeah, if you have like an attribute of a time till ret re retirement, you could find out things like all of our key knowledge people in this team are due to retire within a year. That's a pretty clear signal that, you know, like, do we have a succession plan in place? No, well, maybe we need one immediately. All right, let's shivy on to, oh, there was, a, was there another question? Um, I'll go back one, oh, maybe. Um, Network now would be interesting to use for Corona networking between it's uh, how they switch off in the crisis of powers. Yes, that's an interesting um, idea. I'm not going to start like trying to think of that now. We can go to the discussion. All right, so we we have our data. We have it all in a system that allows us to do math on it, and we can start uh, and we start extracting uh, insights from that. So um, what do we do about that? Well, the idea is that we're now enabled or empowered to engineer at the relationship level. Um, um, so the typical class of network interventions um, are creating links that are missing. So if you have two segregated uh, clusters that really need to be coordinating, um, we can identify promising nodes that we can put into a room with a new task of saying, your job is to get these two clusters coordinating because business performance is um, suffering. Um, you can remove links that are unhelpful. So for example, in um, dismantling terrorist networks, the messengers usually come high on the list, like take them out and you start fragmenting it. A lot of the social isolations um, uh, measures that are now being uh, enforced in practice are exactly about this, removing links that are unhelpful. Um, and uh, designating specialist roles to nodes. So you might find nodes in your system that are optimized to do something for your business goal, 
uh, but when you flip the name label on, you find that um, uh, you find that uh, 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 sorry, I got distracted by I've got a square shared screenshot. Um, Michal, if that's okay, I'll look at that after I've gone through the slides and then tell you whether there's any PBI reporting like this for my data. Um, so here's a network weaving example. Um, this is actually from a food producer cooperative in uh, America somewhere, like in the Carolinas. Um, and essentially, like a lot of cottage industries, things that uh, um, noticed that they weren't collaborating effectively um, to uh, create a, a, a local market for the, you know, an effective local market for the food. So on first mapping, they find that um, it's all organized into these either isolated people or very small clusters, you know, with the exception of this, these two starting to look like bigger clusters. Um, so in a network knitting process, if our goal is to make this into a kind of an effective coordinated um, network, the next thing we we'll want to do is introduce a hub. That could be a government program or an institution or, self or, or an organization or a designated person, but their job at this point is to create connections between themselves and the identified existing clusters like that. Um, and then the next thing, uh, multi-hub small world network. Um, so there's this idea in, in network knitting called closing the triangle, which is essentially, uh, you know, if I know this cluster and I know this cluster would work very well together, I would want to engineer a link which connects them somehow um, in a way. So here we have a couple of closing the triangle examples from our previous thing, and we get into multi-hub small world network. I won't go into the difference between small world scale free and stuff. It's a little bit academic and abstract, but um, this is kind of like a small families of networks, but at the limit, they all have some connection to each other with the hubs. And then eventually you get into a core and periphery. So these are the really kind of um, either their mission or role is to coordinate the network and uh, they have the resources available to do that and they assume new roles. Um, to facilitate that, and then the periphery might be the producer who sends stuff to a processing uh, factory, but then gets it connected to whatever the distribution outlets and things like that. So that's a nice little story from fragmented networks, adding links strategically um, so that you arrive at a more resilient, robust network. Now, this thing can be attacked by financial crisis, competition, whatever, and you could remove quite a few of the nodes before the whole thing would collapse, right? This has now got resilience built into it. A um, couple of examples, just so that those metrics kind of, you get a real world situation. Uh, we talked about degree, just the number of links that come in and out. Um, this was um, from a previous client. Uh, and there we ask, like, who do you have to ask permission to make um, uh, a decision? Um, and we see that most of the decision comes through these four people. Um, and that creates a lot of friction because their idea is um, uh, uh, that decision, decision should, making should be devolved. Um, but really their patterns of behavior like this. Interestingly, like what, what this really you know, blew the mind of the client was that the CEO was nowhere there. Right, so the CEO completely removed from any decision making. They didn't really like that. They didn't think that's the way it should be, but they've never understood that before. Um, and this is uh, professional um, support. Essentially, this organization had a problem because these two people were in like burnout mode, and we can understand why they were in burnout mode. And now we've got a strategy to say um, it was assumed that you would go for professional support to uh, these people because of their personalities and their position but it turns out to have bad results and consequences for the organization um, uh, can, can I, yes I, i'm just trying to think like i don't i can't give away confidential thing but i can tell you um, that uh, two years after this mapping was done because this uh, in part because this issue wasn't addressed, those two people left the organization. Now where do you think they are, right? <laughs> so that burnout was bad for them and they had the data to do stuff about it. Um, uh, yeah, community detection, kind of an algorithm that detects non-overlapping group. 
Um, so here's an organization, what we're seeing on the left-hand side, it's quite small, but it has a high structural complexity. There's basically 11 teams. Ma managerially, there's like, or structurally and managerially, there's 11 different teams. Some of them are really small, some of them are slightly bigger clusters. Um, so they were structured into 11 teams, and one of the problems they have is um, because it's such high fragmentation, almost all decisions require like two or three different managers. And they can never move forward on decision making because like one manager is away or whatever. So we run the community detection algorithm and then it suggests that actually there's one, two, three, four naturally occurring communities of how people are working. So the answer this data is suggesting is you, you have a way to massively simplify your structure because that's the way people are already working with each other anyway, independent of your managerial structure and, and complexity. Um, and this particular example is quite interesting because we can go to the, then look at between the centrality, uh, which is the bridginess, you know, this is the terrorist you want to take out or the um, super spreader you want to take away. So if you remember this one, it turns out when you turn the name labels on, in this organization, both of these cluster are customer facing parts of the organization. And so we ask the question, why are the two customer, why are these two, why are the customer facing part of the organization separated in these two clusters, right? And not one, why don't they occur as one naturally occurring community? And when we look at the betweenness centrality values, we understand that this individual person is the key to either why these two clusters are separate or how they could come back together again. So there from some like pattern searching and asking questions in relation to the business goals and then applying the metrics, we can quite forensically say, flip the name label on and bring that person into the room and ask them, do you know why these two clusters are apart? Um, or um, uh, and like if that is in fact the reasoning or do you recognize that you are the, uh, the, the key to bringing them together? And it could be that somebody needs to be reprofiled, that the node's role needs to be reprofiled as the bringer together of these two clusters for a unified cu customer experience. Kind of thing. So that's just a tidy example of when you start combining different analytical methods, you can start focusing in on really specific intervention points or leverage points within your system. Um, finally, eigenvector influence metrics. I'll do a, um, a quick, so you can measure the influence of a node in a network, which is kind of like some funky math that determines how, that you're important because the people you're connected to have some measure of importance. And eigenvector is the traditional one. Cat centrality is more appropriate in um, social system. So this is a, a harvest of a Twitter data from a particular event, this is one team gov uh, kind of thing. And once we had the data, we could run the math on it. Um, and we thought, how can we use the insight we can get from the data? This is another visualization of the same network. Um, uh, so there's a couple of hundred people, like maybe 500 people in here. Uh, let's put a sexy picture on, the, on Twitter that links to an ego surfing thing. There's a website where you can click on this and find your name that looks a little bit like, well, basically that's the website. You can see the hand going there. So I could click myself and then see who I'm connected to, things like that. So let's put this sexy picture, but let's target it really um, uh, according to the data that we have. So you see there, some of these people have been tagged into the picture. How did we do that? Well, we find the nodes with the highest eigenvector centrality. We tag them in the picture, and our theory is because these are the most influential nodes in the picture, if we tag them directly and they're interested and they retweet, it will propagate through the network really effectively. So what's our results? We get 167 link clicks. Maybe for internet famous people, that's no biggie. For me, that's pretty much the, the biggest ever. Um, I have in my in my Twitter account. And that's simply using the data to identify the influencers and target them in the hope that we're going to get a good propagation in the network. So it's a practical application 
on that. I, I won't go into, I think we've kind of like almost come to an hour. I'll, you have the slides because I've given the link. Um, there's some more heavy text and some links to some of all this uh, Krebs stuff. Uh, I won't really go into that um, uh, now. I think it's more important that we kind of like open up the discussion to more people. Um, what was, was I going to say something about emergence? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, one uh, final point. Um, so if you get into network um, science, you'll probably eventually read a, a paper by a guy called Mark Granovetter um, called The Strength of Weak Ties. And um, earlier I mentioned that when we're mapping the relationships, we can put uh, quantitative uh, uh, data in the relationship. Um, so here what we're looking at is the um, communication patterns between um, uh, people in this organization split amongst three different locations. So the, the green, the blue, and the orange are three different locations. Um, and then here we have a filtration of that, which is based on the strong ties. Uh, so these are people who have communicate with like a frequency of uh, more uh, daily or, um, uh, or so. And then here we filtered it the other way where we have the communication, uh, uh, the, a map of the people who communicate really infrequently. Um, and this is kind of a good approximation for weak ties. There's something interesting, like sometimes it's the obvious thing is who's talking to a lot, well that forms a coherent whole and that's where we should be looking at. But actually identifying where the weak ties are um, is, as evidenced by the Granovetter paper, a really um, uh, important uh, metric in order to identify innovation uh, potential because these are people who don't usually talk to each other but occasionally um, have much uh, uh, you know quite unusual boundary spanning um, uh, connections and it's in those sorts of um, uh, interactions in which novel cross-pollination of ideas between uh, things are. So I did want to sort of specifically mention that to um, stimulate the conversation. And I think that's my last slide. So I'll probably go back to the second one so you can have the link and then look at them in your own. And then uh, I'll see and catch up on questions. Um, shall we hand over to Becca or Mikhail while I look through the questions? Uh, uh, yeah, hi, Mikhail here. So I was thinking it might be fun also to hear what people, what types of experiences people have in, in network analysis. I know Mikhail, who was online with us, uh, or at least was a while back, or uh, it would be great to hear, hear what he's doing in the field. And uh, I, I can also show you some stuff of what uh, uh, EIT Climate Kit, which is a European Union uh, organization for tackling climate change, is doing in relation to network thinking. If that's of interest, but um, maybe give the floor to Mikal. Hello, uh, my real name is Mikal Aiti. I work at the Power Media Finland uh, as a research and development manager for mainly about content, music, and stuff. But I also a member of a social media research foundation uh, in California. Uh, I'm I'm doing with uh, Mark Smith and his team uh, Power BI report from uh, from Node Excel. I think you might not know know Node Excel. Uh, I also uh, have lectures with uh, Jukka Hohtamäki about GPV and Node Excel and PBI, and uh, I'm part of the uh, I'm. I'm Every now and then, with the Raya Pinta Association get-togethers and so on. So, so uh, my my Sami name is Michal. So, so and that's my uh, Twitter user handle. If you and I, I do post a lot about uh, network analytics. And lately, I've been doing a lot about Twitter stuff and especially uh, getting data from Twitter. Uh, so. So, and, and I'm quite active also on the GEFI Facebook group. Uh, first I was looking for support, now I'm giving some. 
Well, I think maybe you should have given the presentation. <laughs> uh, no, but, but it's it's really interesting because I was planning to start an ONA for Bauer Media Finland last summer, but then uh, then it got postponed for various reasons and so on. Uh, and actually, uh, this was very really, really enlightening to me. What what should be done when we are starting one? And uh, Bauer Media is a uh, Pan European company. We have something like 12,000 people working in different countries. We have some 150 radio stations and so on. So uh, uh, it was really interesting to see that this my analytics or so. I'm going to have a look on that and try to get data from our organization from all 365. But but if you anyone if you like to know about Node Excel. And the, the screenshot I shared was the, the report I've been creating for for a social media research foundation together with Harald Meyer and Mark Mark Smith and Arbre Jenny. And uh, it's all about uh, the big data, uh, social data uh, from from the data source with the with the metrics that you get. So if 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 there if you would like to develop something for the PBI from from your data, I'm, I'm ready to cooperate. Uh, great, yeah, it's something I've been uh, thinking I need to look into. I'm a bit of a PBI basic. Uh, uh, my confession is uh, between Windows XP and Windows 10, I never used anything but Linux. Um, so when PBI came out, I completely, I was, completely lost so I'm, I'm really on a catch-up curve um, with that stuff but I think definitely that there's uh, a, a lot of competence and understanding uh, that maybe we need to think of a networks analysis subgroup or join another one um, that already exists rather than set a new one up um, you said that you were thinking of extracting your uh, network data from the 0365 um, yeah, yes, we, 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 we just transferred all of our company into uh, one and same cloud in all our countries. And, yeah. and I, I have, I'm just, a matter of fact, I just had a network analytics session with our uh, uh, data team, uh, data scientist team in Hamburg. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, we're just learning stuff. The, the yeah. API is used in Finland. Uh, a lot, but not in Germany or in UK or Poland. So, so I'm oh. I'm telling them how how we're doing stuff here. And here, I just posted a, a sample uh, of a PBI report from one Node Excel report that that Harald Meyer has done. From it's about build a search of build the German tabloid newspaper. Mm -hmm. You open up that you can you can have a look at what, what's it like. And there are several pages. This is the public public uh, share of PBI, but it's interactive report on 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 the data. Uh, uh, so just get you an idea what it look what it can look like, and so yeah. on. It's 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 interactive PowerPoint and Excel in one baked in one. So and uh, I, if if. I can have, actually I'm having a lecture later in the autumn uh, at the Tampere University about Gephi Node Excel and PBI. So okay. You, so so you, uh, welcome to join there. Yes, uh, if, if the movement is unrestricted, I'm happy to do. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's unrestricted. Uh, uh, I can actually, uh, uh, well, we can, we can continue later. I can, yeah. I can share. share, share. Uh, it's already set up by Jukka Huhtamäki and so on. So great, very interested. Um, there was a, a, one thing we should also uh, discuss, which is I didn't really go into it, but maybe that's a more bilateral discussion than for the whole audience. Um, but when you start extracting um, communication data from, you know, uh, 0365 and stuff, then you're getting into Fairly tricky uh, ethical and uh, legal territory. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's the that's the first what I'm gonna t talk with our da data guys and the management that 
uh, what are the restrictions that are there because there, there might be different restrictions be in different countries for instance yeah but uh, but we are in EU uh, except British uh, okay UK just left so yeah. it's uh, but if, if we could somehow restrict uh, take the data from Finland for instance to start with so I could start playing with that because already here uh, uh, Bauer Media now is uh, energy and nostalgia uh, we, we joined from the beginning of the year with our sales systems and so on. And then, then we have also a media from Bori that has, uh, uh, so we actually in the, in the face that three different sales and production organizations are getting one for the next 10 years period of making radio. Okay. So, so Bauer Media has Radio Nova, Iskema, City, KISS, Energy, Nostalgy, Kasari, Usari, uh, Suomi Rock, all these radio stations, and uh, and it's all all those sales. We are we are approximately fifty percent of the radio market in in money wise uh, mm. commercial radio. Uh, Very interesting. But just um, Mikhail, yeah. well, uh, Seppo, while you're link surfing, um, a question of the ethics and uh, stuff of data use and, and things came up. I don't suppose you could dig out the uh, the Open Data Institute has a data ethics canvas, um, and also the UK government has a data eth ethics framework for public services data things. I don't know if those might be useful links to share. Uh, while you do that, there was a question saying, um, it would be fun to hear how easy it would be to use Gephi to collect Twitter data on our own computers. Um, so uh, I've got Gephi open, um, unless anybody stops me, I'm going to share and show you um, how easy it is, uh, Gephi. Yeah, I can tell you, I, I had never done this stuff before, and then two, two years ago I was talking with Esko, and Esko was telling me that you should, uh, you should uh, um, install Gephi, and I, I did a <laughs> pretty big uh, data collection on Suomi Arena that year. <laughs> And so I mean, other, yeah, that's right. I remember now. Yeah. Um, so if it's working, you should all see this. Um, bear in mind that in order to uh, essentially, Gephi is an open source network visual, uh, analysis and visualization platform. Um, works on all the platforms. Uh, they have a series of plugins here um, that you can. It's now initializing. But uh, some of the analytical metrics, some of the layout algorithms are available in the plugins. Um, and uh, so there's one called the Twitter streaming. Um, here's my installed ones. Twitter streaming importer. And if you don't have it, you just you can search for it, click it, and it'll update it. And it's very easy. You don't need to know any code or anything. Um, the one thing is that you do need a Twitter a developer access and you, you need API keys and stuff and that's gotten a little bit more difficult anybody can do it still but you just have to um, uh, promise that you're not going to share anything with the government and stuff and then they'll give you access that step you need to do um, first go to your Twitter apps and um, get a API credentials so here there's a credential button I won't click that because if I do I'll show you all my API keys and that's really not good um, um, but I've plugged in API keys in there, which means my Twitter street streaming importer works. Um, and once I've got that, I can do things like um, users to follow, or I can put a user and a list, and it'll it'll bring all of the. So I have a Brexit list, for example. I could do that if I add from the list. It'll add all of the people who are on that list. Um, I didn't really want to do that because uh, shit. Now we have to look at that list. Really, I was going to use the COVID example. Okay, we can also add the the COVID. So words to follow. Um, pretty trending discussion these days has got the hashtag COVID nineteen. Um, and then the type of network that we want. So we've got different choices. 
full Twitter network will get all of the users, the tweets, the hashtags, media links, files. It's going to get big, enormously big. Um, hashtag network is if I put one hashtag in, what are the other hashtags that start going? So you can start mapping conversational patterns. Um, uh, emoji network I, and this Bernard Darmus projection, there's, it's so new I don't really know what it does yet, but user network is usually quite important, uh, quite interesting. So let us suggest, um, forget that it's got my Brexit list voted, but this is probably going to be the most action, the COVID one. I, I just wanted to develop a user network of the people uh, who are using the COVID hashtag. Oh, I need to start a new project. Um, okay. Let's add that one. We've got those as well. Uh, I can also uh, location follow, so I could draw a geographical box around Helsinki if I just wanted to hear people who are talking about COVID. Uh, in Helsinki, I'll leave this open. So are you ready? What you want to watch here is as nodes come in, you get like the nodes and the number of edges. And this is a directed um, uh, graph. So I connect and now we, it's quite a popular topic. You should see the kind of data coming in. Is this real time data? Real time now. This is people talking about COVID plus those on my Brexit list now. We're already, if the example I showed you before from um, the One Team Gov event, that harvest happened over a period of seven days and probably in total got as many nodes as we have now in <laughs> 15 seconds or something. Um, and now when we get to this point, we start thinking like, actually, it's just a useless square. So I might have to start looking at using some of the layout algorithms um, for, for Satlas 2 is kind of pretty standard one. And now I can see some topology starting or topography starting to uh, emerge. And then with my filters, I could isolate the central um, component, for example. Uh, it might be struggling with uh, ingesting the data and running that filter at the same time. Right, I can see some chat flashing. Where's my chat window gone? Just me putting some links to. Ah, right, okay. Right. So, Mikael, did you have any other questions? Now we've got this running. I think it, no, it's still ingesting. Yeah, yeah, so, so this is like really interesting stuff. And um, when we talk about systems thinking, I think this gives us a big picture of the people who are involved in some type of topic or in some type of activity. And you can see how easy getting this data off of Twitter, Twitter is, so that's pretty cool. Now, if you follow Miskal on, Miskal on Twitter, he has, uh, he's doing a bunch of analysis all the time, posting some cool pictures, like uh, he had one picture yeah. when Silaka League came out, and uh, <laughs> there was this discussion between Silaka League and what was the other group. It was so malicious. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you, if you, if you can share share me the, uh, I, I could I could show from my Gephi what I can do. Yeah. You can uh, you yeah. can share. So uh, I'll stop in sharing. The in the bottom tab, there's this share button. You can just use, use that. Share my screen, Samer Gephi here. Share. I'll co-host you, Michal. So. So so here's my Gephi. So uh, for, for when you when you do search search data with Node Excel, uh, you I'll, I'll change the data. I open different different data data set. I I I just did a search from Ilta Ilta Lehti and Ilta Sanomat. Don't say so. Here, let's let's here's uh, okay. Let's take the actual. I'll open 
is it this one here open yeah here's the raw data so what, what you what you open up with the raw data is that this is how this is what you get directly it's a cube cube of nodes and in, in all this attributes these come from directly from node excel they have slightly different names like in in Jeffy you call it modularity yeah. but in in node excel it's vertex group and so so what we've done with the gx uh, output from from node excel is that we've added the uh, underscore node excel to each and every column so that you can once you run the betweenness for instance here mm -hmm. in the uh, uh network diameter here and when it's done when you go back to the uh, attributes here you can see it between a centrality and between a centrality from node excel mm. so you can distinct them from to to each other so what what you do here is you okay let's 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 play that we don't do any metrics from from Gephi. we take the vertex group we run coloring we do ranking by the eigenvector because that's what you liked and we also do the same for for the we do some spline for for those and spline for the node size as well apply then we go to force atlas 2 run run the metrics uh, we we want some we want some distance for it uh, some more oops too much <laughs> so it's getting to the borders here yeah and so it's blind and and this is one one fine trick here you want to be able to read the data so what you we get a giant component we stop this is that the giant component we take the range and we want, want to have take the eigenvector centrality here run there and th then we then we slide it a bit we filter oh too much we filter like this so we have 1600 most important things what we do we don't filter that but we use this one to take the, the so that we get less labels so that it's more readable and then 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 when you then you can uh, play with the uh, how much you get how how broad the edges are if you like to have more and when you get a nice picture like that you have to send it to the geffy pop art twitter stream <laughs> <laughs> well well that's what that's what i do when i when i when I, I, I do tweets about if you go and have a look at my Twitter account, I, I share this kind of tweets a lot. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I do, I share the Node Excel workbook and and and, and the uh, picture here. So here, here's what I shared earlier about the same data. Uh, it's about and what I did here with this data that I added a, 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 a new column here, follower class. And I, 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 I looked at the followers and I added number one to all the columns that had less than 10 followers. And so on, went to forward. And when, I, when we look at this, we see that uh, the, the red follow, red dots are users that are, are having zero to 10. Uh, followers so you can you you can create easily create your own 
uh, attributes that you uh, you want to visualize the the network with. So this oh. this search this search was about who mentioned Ilta Sanamat or Ilta Lehti, and and there there is this bunch of people uh, that you can go down to and filter, saying that these actually are probably not real persons or uh, or what actually so and and once what once you once you get this data to to the pbi you can actually analyze into depth what was the thing that they were talking about uh, and so on just just a quick show yeah. yeah so you can see there's a lot of trolls <laughs> Trolls possibly try to influence the discussion or, or joining the discussions that are related to Precisely. and Ilta Sanomat uh, posts. And, and the, the difference between Twitter and streaming importer is that it records live. But Node Excel, you can read data back to seven days. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's another tool called Social Weds uh, that is by Alessandro. Uh, What's his last name? Anyway, from it, social ways that you can you can make it record back to uh, seven days, max to five hundred five thousand tweets, and after that you can convert that search to that uh, uh, to scheduled search that it will start recording your search up to fifty k tweets. Mm. So so you can have in 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 the situ for instance for Finnish market fifty k tweets on any subject is really a lot. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, we, we had a, so I think the tool nerds have got their full <laughs> and, the, and the Twitter interesting. Uh, I could go on for days because uh, uh, I, I recently learned a trick when you're um, listening to an event by using the Yi Fan Fu layout algorithm. You can identify emerging uh, bot clusters by fan shapes. So it's a visual way to see the evolution of bots attacking a particular subject because they have a particular topographical pattern that you can see. So if you're doing a real time live, you can, you can start picking them off straight away. Um, but I think uh, for the just thinking about the rest of the crowd that's gathered who maybe aren't like the tool nerds and are thinking a bit more, how do I uh, apply this in my context? There was a question about the uh, applying this in sociocracy based organizations to make circles and better decision making. Um, then Mika said, let's talk about that soon. Did you mean that today or uh, some other session? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was thinking about that today because like uh, that's very much related to the, the, the knitting the network stuff that you were showing earlier. Yeah. So uh, do you want to share that story? So about June Holly, who was working with um, uh, Valdis on that project. Do you remember that? Are you talking to me? Yes. Or, uh, yes. Tanya? Yes. No, I don't, I don't uh, remember. Okay. But, uh, I, I'm, I'm lost in context because June Holly's come up in uh, some stuff recently, but I yeah. can't remember in connection with Valdis. Maybe you refresh yeah. my mind. So uh, if you show, can you show the, 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 the network picture with the separate you know um small groups related to the food system and then there ah, come yeah. these hubs and that was so that tunes yeah 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 uh, uh i would if i had my slides <laughs> yeah. So yeah. June Holly, June Holly is like uh, she calls herself a network weaver. So that, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's essentially a facilitator who brings together the people and you know facilitates these uh, uh, trustful discussions in which people who don't necessarily know each other from previously start you know building a shared understanding and start building building a shared view on things. So. So uh, this is a project that June Holly and Valdis Krebs, who is the network analysis guy, were working on. Yeah. So, so the beginning of the network was like there were a lot of small, small groups, and then they were started thinking that hey, we we should start bringing these together so that they would have synergies between them, and then they came to the next slide. So um, they 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 probably became the hub that brought together all of these groups at, at first. 
but their goal was to build the network. So it wasn't that they stay, you know, in the in the middle of the group for for the whole time, but they wanted to actually start weaving the um, relationships between the people, and they were using probably uh, very facilitative tools to do that. And uh, then they got to the next phase, which was where where they started becoming, you know, a lot of lot more of these hubs and weavers and leaders of who started knitting their own networks together and. And uh, the next picture shows the result of this type of process where they are intentionally trying to build, you know, a very tight core group of organizations and people who who can collaborate around a given topic. So this was a very, very, very facilitated um, process, which I think might be very interesting to Tanya. And I know Tanya was Tanya was mentioning in the chat that she is a climate kick uh, facilitator. I'd be really interested in hearing more about okay. that. But before we go into that, I might show a few climate kick slides from myself. I'll so, stop uh, sharing. You have the so, screen. So when we're talking about network analysis, we're looking at mostly the people layer. So how do people relate to each other? But uh, climate kick is trying to tackle um, um, they're trying to tackle uh, climate change and they're trying to have an impact on you know many things so they believe that to have an impact on climate change they they have to you know do urban transitions which means that for example cre create green and resilient cities and accelerate cre uh, clean and urban urban mobility and for example they want to promote sustainable land use and they want to uh, work on projects that are transforming the food system and this is like uh, these are like systemic issues that in in the real society that you want to affect, and and this is something that you might want to start mapping your uh, social networks to. So climate kick, they're using this type of tool called Exaptive. So Exaptive is their portfolio of uh, innovation projects, and and they can they can start start out with uh, you know mapping these different. Um, Goals that they have, as I was showing, on their webpage, and then they believe that they have to have some kinds of leverage, lever, levers of change, which they are borrowing from the Donella Meadows stuff. Um, for example, they believe that we have to develop information flows for for climate change to happen better, and they believe that we have to develop people's skills to have an impact on climate change and we need new ways of govern doing governance in organizations and that we need of course new technologies that help with climate change and we need to change individuals behaviors for example we need to have help people transition from short term thinking into long very long term thinking and the cool thing with their uh, innovation portfolio is that they're actually able to map all of their partner institutions together and all the projects that are related to that and um, and given that they are able to map all of this together, they can, for example, try to find all the people who are related to technology projects in the climate kick network. So, and and uh, the this system that they're using to map all of this information, you can also go down to the per person level. So, so I just picked the person level. So now now I can find all the people. Who and projects who are related to it, information flows. And the system that they're using is called Exaptive, and Exaptive is, is a machine learning system. So when you log into there and you start saying that, well, I'm working on stuff and I'm interested in different types of stuff, it starts suggesting people to you who might be interesting for you to meet. So this is a one way of you know making serendipitous uh, connections over you know vast network. Um, another thing that uh, Exaptive has been working on is building a network around COVID-19. So it's a network map of different organizations and their needs and and uh, and and what they can offer. And and this is one way also that they can start, you know, intentionally building an understanding of who's who are the players, you know, in the COVID COVID space. And uh, Esco was talking about when you start understanding the different resources and different know-hows that people have you can start mapping uh you can start uh, bringing those people together so this is like uh, the really really high level view into this into this stuff but then when you when you um 
when you get into the nitty gritty, so the practical stuff, hold on, I'll show you a picture. Uh, you, and you start understanding on the network level that who, who are the people that you want to connect. The real, the real work looks like this. So you, these people come from you know, uh, very different organizations, so they're not in a single organization. And uh, they're using, Climate City is using a lot of systemic facilitation to help these people understand what their relationship to both these uh, climate change issues is and uh, within the network. And they use these facilitated um, workshops to start building these, the real relationships between these people to each other so that they can both uh, sub, uh, support the building of the, you know, uh, relationship of all of these people to, to these uh, climate, climate change impact goals and also to each other. So I think this is really cool. Mm. And, and uh, I know, Tanya, would you like to share your uh, experiences? So I, I heard you're climate climate peak coach now, so are you working on some kind of stuff like this? Um, yeah, well, hi. Um, hi. Actually, I'm just starting, so Larry Karrenen, who was the, has been uh, the coach for the Climate Kick project here in Finland, asked me, he has been doing it for two years, and now he asked me to join him uh, with the facilitation. Uh, we are going to, I mean, the whole program is a, it is a bit of in danger, of course, because of the COVID now. And for example, I was supposed to go to Frankfurt this week to train myself in the facilitation and the methods but now the whole system is online so tomorrow i will have my first training but i think this this whole um escos presentation was very very interesting because often i noticed that um the ideas are ideas in my, our heads and and our ideas about concerning about other ideas but it's not really practical but now when we actually see a map of interactions and and people's relationships that's that's kind of tangible and practical so it would be nice to kind of get some more practical examples of how to use this or even actually try it myself uh, so maybe the austrian story <laughs> yes uh, it comes up as a practical one, but uh, from uh, what you were saying and, and uh, what Mikael showed before, um, it's a really interesting context for network mapping. But all, uh, all my instinct is saying is like, I want to know what's in the relationship data. You know, there's a line between two people, but does it mean um, if it's to a person in a project, does it mean? Um, uh, I have part. I'm funding it, or I'm participating in it, or I object to it, or I am trying to sabotage it. Like a, a relationship without a qualification um, can mean almost nothing at all. And uh, so, quantifying or qualifying and quantifying those relationships, I think, is super important. Uh, also, one quick note, Mika, when you showed the network map. I don't know if people spotted, but some of the curves, uh, some of the links were curved and some of them were straight. Um, if you're unfamiliar with network maps, if there's a curved link, generally the, the uh, protocol is that the, uh, the clockwise direction shows the direction. It's a directed link. So if there's a node here and a node here and the link goes like that, what it's saying is it's a relationship. The first node, pointed to the second node. And then if that second node pointed to the first node, you might have another, so a kind of a, a what do you call it, vene or whatever. Um, uh, but in some visualizations, they use the, the uh, uh, protocol that a reciprocal link is straight and unidirectional links are curved. So if you don't know that, that uh, you might not have read everything that that visualization is showing you. Um, so uh, this is the Austrian story. 
Um, I, I got this from Peter Senga, who the systems thinkers will be familiar, and you might re remember it if you've read all of his books and stuff. Um, but essentially, it, in or was it Otto Sharma? I don't know, one of those two. Um, there was a company, a manufacturing company in Austria, which had the headquarters in Vienna, where all the strategy and kind of board were hanging out. And they had the manufacturing plants we, uh, in all of the kind of significant cities like Innsbruck and Salzburg and Graz and things like that. And uh, the problem this company had was that they, um, uh, they had a really, they'd invested in a brilliant strategy team, but the, the organization just could not execute it. Um, whatever they decided in Vienna was not happening in the factories. So then they, they did a, this is already in the 70s, but a, a network analysis on it. Um, and then this one character uh, came up as really interesting, this one node, because everybody in all of the manufacturing plants was basically pointing to this node and saying that um, this is where they got their current news about the uh, strategy of the uh, organization. Bear in mind in the 70s, that's before the internet and email and all of that. Um, and then when they flipped the name labels on, they found out he was the guy who drove the truck between the different factories in the cities. But this guy never went to Vienna. He wasn't connected with the strategy machine or board or senior management at all. Um, but in the cities, when this guy showed up, they thought this is the most well-informed person because he's just been to the other facilities and he could tell us the news from there. So that's kind of like a quite cute example of where you might find that the node you need in order to fix a business problem that you have might not at all be in the place that you would traditionally look for those solutions like the internal newsletter writer or, or uh, whatever. Uh, once they figured that out, they sent this guy to Vienna and they issued him some official paperwork to <laughs> distribute to the different factories and the story changed quite quickly.